Good afternoon, everybody. Um, great to have you with us uh, this uh, 23rd day of July 2020, uh, when we are having another uh, webinar this afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, just to kick us off this afternoon, uh, we will start uh, with the national anthem and we will be able to uh, recite the words of the national anthem in English. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty. Plenty be found within our borders. Okay, so once again, uh, welcome. Uh, we've had some uh, housekeeping tips uh, shared already on the screen. Uh, we remind you to be able to use uh, the chat facility uh, to be able to uh, put in any comments or questions that you might have as, as we go along. Uh, this afternoon, we have a session on mediating council. Uh, this particular session will be taken through by uh, Dr. Francis uh, Karioke. Uh, Dr. Karioke is a member of the faculty at the Strathmore Law School. He has interests in natural law, environmental law, property law, as well as conflict management. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. He is also a mediator. Uh, so Dr. Karioke will be able to take us through uh, the, the session this afternoon. We will also have a commentary uh, from Mohammed Said. Uh, Mohammed Said is a young mediator uh, trained by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and he's also a paralegal. He will be joining us uh, just in a little while. Uh, to get us going, I'll just give an opportunity uh, to Dr. Karyuki to be able to say hello uh to the participants before we are able to move on uh Kari Busana, Daktari. Uh, thank you so much uh, sarah good afternoon to you all participants it's a good joy afternoon. to see you all and i look forward to this afternoon's uh, session thank you so much okay uh thank you very much um just to kick us off uh, like I mentioned, Mohammed will be joining us uh, briefly uh, in a little while. So to, to, to set us going for this uh, particular session, uh, I will share my experience as a mediator and my experience in a mediating council. So in just a little while. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Sarah Ater. I am a Judiciary Accredited Mediator. And just to kick us off for this particular session, uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my experience with Mediating Council. Uh, the, the photograph that we have here uh, actually talks about uh, the experience that so far I have with the Mediating Council in the course of uh, my mediation. As uh, you can see, it is uh, a road that is, uh, it's a rough road, but it is clear. As you can see, there's a car on the road, so it, it works somewhat. Uh, you can see uh, there are some rocks, uh, so the road has been uh, uh, cleared. Uh, the rocks are there. Uh, I, I am hoping the road would be able to survive rain so that uh, we can be able to walk even through the rain. Uh, but like I said, because there's a car, it means that even though the road is winding and it has some difficulties, the road is actually uh, working.
Let me. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, in short, this is a very good illustration of the experience that I have uh, with mediating counsel. And uh, wh why do I say this? Um, I say this because, just a minute. Sorry, just give me a minute again and I'll get that. Okay, so I, I already talked about the road that I have and uh, this particular road, I'm having a bit of, okay, great. Uh, so we are on my road with mediating council and uh, I have some bumps that I actually face on this road and uh, the bumps that I face in my work with mediating council are uh, the, the first one is the communication and uh, my experience, not in all, not with all, is that uh, communication can be difficult. Uh, many times uh, you send out emails, you request that there are replies to the emails, you request as well that uh, there would be acknowledgement of the same and this isn't always forthcoming. So this is uh, quite a bump on the road. Uh, the other issue that I have faced with uh, mediating council is timekeeping and uh, again I will say not for all but with some uh, then timekeeping is quite an issue and you know we agree about the meeting time a particular time and uh, quite often you will call five ten minutes into the time and uh, they will tell you that they are on the way and this is interesting because I think these are people who don't uh, miss their flights or their trains or their buses. So uh, I think it is pretty possible to be able to keep time, particularly when the time has been agreed up front. Uh, and so largely because of these two things, I would say that uh, the other concern that I have that uh, is a bump is the issue of uh, commitment. I'm not sure why. Sorry, I don't know. Uh, just give me a minute again. Um, the other issue that I have is the issue of, of commitment and this ideally comes back uh, to the issue of, you know, going into the mediation in good faith. If, if you're not, you know, uh, responding to the email communication, if you're not uh, showing up when you're supposed to meet, if you're not keeping time when you're supposed to be meeting, then there are questions about uh, your commitment to the process. Uh, and you know the whole uh, mediation uh, uh, agenda just uh, I'm sorry I will do that again I think it's good for us to be able to see this um, okay Yeah, so I mentioned the issue of, uh, of commitment. So uh, how do I cope as a mediator? What, what do I do in order to be able to, to manage myself? Uh, so I have what I will share as my working piece. And my working piece are, are three. So uh, my first P is no parking. So I, I, I keep with it. I stay with it. I stay at the process. I, 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 I 
I remain patient. So even when the emails are not replied to, even when you know someone will tell you, and, and I've had this many times when uh, counsel will tell me, no, I have never received email from you and you send them an email again. And uh, they say, no, that's not my email. And they send you another email and another email. So this is something that quite calls for a lot of patience. Persistence is another one. And there are times when, uh, somebody will keep telling you that you know I'm not available at this time I'm not available on this date I'm not available at this time and it becomes you know the same thing over and over again uh, but what I do is I persist and I keep asking them you know okay then you're not available at this time then give us a time give us a date let's work with your time let's work with your date and the other thing I'm very keen to maintain is professionalism so of course when you encounter some of these things, then uh, you are bound uh, perhaps to, to, to be upset or uh, to, to get cross. And so it, it's very important uh, for yourself as an individual mediator and also for the sake of the profession itself, mediation, to be able to maintain a high level of professionalism. So even in the communication that is, is that I, you know, go on communicating with them, whether it's, verbally on phone in the sessions making sure that everything is done in a very very uh, professional way so that this uh, four things essentially are what keep me going in the mediation process even in the face of the different bumps that i face on the road uh, so uh, finally uh, i will say that there are really great mediating counsel so i have had some bad experiences with some mediating counsel but i have also had very good experiences with some counsel who will reply to the email who will keep time who will you know remain committed to the process and run through it with you and i'm a, i must also say that there are some mediators who are sloppy and you know who don't uh follow through who don't communicate in good time who don't uh, keep their word who don't keep time so it's 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 something that all of us both the mediators as well as the mediating council need to be able to give our very best and this is because mediation works so um thank you very much uh that's my uh brief uh presentation of my experience as a mediator with mediating council, I will just uh, confirm is if Mohammed is in. No, I don't see Mohammed yet. So we'll go straight away uh, to uh, Dr. Karyuki and uh, just to be able to have uh, his presentation. Uh, Kari Busana Daktari. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that uh, uh, presentation. I think it is. It does speak to most of the aspects that I might uh, be making reference to. Okay. And uh, as I was uh, being asked by uh, Sarah and uh, Wangari, to make this presentation, I asked them about, uh, you know, in terms of what do we mean by mediating counsel? So uh, perhaps uh, that uh, would be one of the things that we need to clarify whether by mediating counsel we mean only the advocate or lawyer representing uh, a party in a mediation or we are also including the mediator who is a, a lawyer or who is an advocate and who is representing uh, or who is uh, handling uh, the mediation. So uh, my reflections and uh, my experiences uh, will uh, touch on a mediating counsel from those two perspectives, uh, looking at uh, uh, experiences and reflections you know, from the perspective of an advocate representing a party, and then uh, reflections and or experiences from the perspective of a mediator who is uh, an advocate or a lawyer. And my presentation uh, has uh, at least five parts. If there's an introduction, another introduction, I look at uh, uh, 
a council who is representing a party in a mediation. And then I look at uh, a mediator who is an advocate. Uh, what are some of the issues that arise uh, when dealing with the advocates? Then I will look at the role of the uh, uh, advocates uh, and mediators as contained in the mediation bill 2020. And then I will uh, have a section on how to work with counsel or how to work with advocates in uh, the mediation process before I conclude. So as um, Sarah has done, this is merely uh, reflections, experiences, and we all have different uh, reflections. We have different experiences uh, with mediation and mediating uh, counsel. And therefore, uh, as I've said, uh, in terms of the conceptual clarity, I sought clarification from the organizers uh, on the first aspect, which is the mediating council. And uh, we seem to have agreed that uh, the term may, there could be other perspectives, may refer to an advocate or a lawyer advising or representing a party in mediation. But mediating counsel, when you use the term, it may also be referring to an advocate who is acting as a mediator. The two uh, limbs of, of mediating counsel uh, uh, is, uh, of course, presents uh, numerous uh, uh, teething concerns in the mediation uh, process be it a scenario whereby an unlawyer is dealing with advocates representing parties, be it a scenario whereby an advocate is acting as a mediator and he has to deal with advocates representing parties. It could also be a scenario whereby a person who is not a lawyer is the mediator, but he or she has to deal with uh, lawyers or advocates. And when we proceed with the discussion, we look at the mediation bill, for example, even that uh, mediator who is not an advocate, there are certain uh, nuances that he or she has to be alive to because uh, the proposed bill seems to have a number of consequences uh, regarding how the mediation process is handled. And then as a matter of uh, introduction, uh, the other question uh, that I was asking myself, do we really need uh, advocates? Do we really need lawyers in the mediation process? You know, seeing that, you know, the mediation, uh, med mediation is, you know, generally a private process, a, pr a process led by parties, you know, they participate, you know, they guide the process, you know, they, you know, even have a key role in the outcome of the process. And, uh, you know, you might know that, yeah, you know, lawyers generally, they are not needed, you know, <laughs> and I use that with a, a lot of caution. They may not be needed in mediation if you compare mediation with the litigation. But if you look at the nature of our justice system, especially in Kenya, which is a common law system, there is a sense in which you know, dispute resolution processes uh, cannot be kept away or divorced from the involvement of lawyers. You know, so yes, you will find lawyers being involved in mediation as party representatives. Uh, it's a common thing, especially when the mediation is proceeding from the court, you know, uh, pursuant maybe to the court next mediation or any other uh, order issued by a, a magistrate or a, or a judge directing that the matter be taken to mediation. You will see the involvement of uh, an advocate or a lawyer. Also, judges are advocates. Judges are lawyers. And so uh, when you are looking at uh, the role of advocates and the, the role of lawyers in the mediation process, it's not only in the pre-mediation process and during the mediation process, but lawyers are also involved in the recognition and the enforcement of the settlement agreement. And that, in that phase, you are dealing with judges. Again, you will also find lawyers involved in, as in-house counsel. You know, lawyers 
acting for corporations, it may be banks, it may be big businesses, you know, they have lawyers. And those lawyers play a quintessential role in uh, promoting mediation, promoting mediation, uh, for example, by advising uh, their corporations or their employers to include mediation clauses in, uh, in uh, commercial agreements, in employment agreements, uh, supply contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we see the involvement of lawyers in mediation even before the mediation process, uh, strictly speaking, uh, begins. But again, we also see lawyers, especially in our court next mediation, uh, playing a key role as mediators. You know? So yes, you may argue that mediation is a private process, doesn't need lawyers who are trained in the adversarial processes, but uh, you have to be alive to this reality that they are party representatives, they are the judges who recognize and enforce the settlement agreements. They are involved in making the decision whether to include mediation as one of the mechanisms for resolving disputes in commercial agreements, in employment contracts, and in other contracts that organizations may come with. And again, they are also mediators. Again, and this is quite problematic, uh, our law now has entrenched alternative dispute resolution, including mediation. And uh, of course, if you look at some of these law, laws, including the proposed mediation bill 2020, there is a sense in which uh, advocates and lawyers have been given, you know, uh, a very uh, critical or dominant role when it comes to uh, the mediation uh, uh, process. So yes, uh, the role of advocates and mediators in mediation uh, is there. Their place in mediation has already been recognized by law. And therefore, it is important for all of us, uh, whether we are lawyers or we are not lawyers, to be alive to this uh, reality. And uh, having said that, it's also important, and I believe most of us have encountered this. Yeah, we may say mediation deals with interests, not positions. We are not concerned with the law because, you know, the position of the law is addressed in courts. But there are times when uh, the mediation process may, you know, elicit or raise legal issues. And when those there are legal issues and you are not a lawyer as the mediator, you know, you are faced with um, a unique and, uh, and a difficult challenge. So again, you know, uh, and if you look at the proposed mediation bill, you will see that, uh, you know, there are even offenses which have been proposed in the law so that if you fail to carry out the process as per the law, for example, you mediate a dispute that is not, uh, you know, mediatable, to use that word, you might find yourself uh, criminally culpable, you know? So, uh, but, you know, even when you're dealing with the dispute itself, there are legal issues that might arise, you know? And uh, that means that lawyers may be called upon to help us in one way or the other. Again, if you look at the types of mediations that are there in our context, for example, if it is a private mediation, there are times, and I have had occasions where parties have approached me privately, you know, asking me about possible avenues for handling uh, matters, and mostly uh, succession matters, you know, and in those cases, uh, you may find yourself as an advocate advising a party to pursue uh, mediation, you know? but of course, uh, that is dependent on whether you are an ally to mediation as an advocate or not, you know. But again, even after that private mediation process has taken place, there might be a settlement agreement which will end up again in court and it will be dealt with or handled by lawyers. So lawyers uh, play a critical role in both private and also in court next mediation. 
And Cotanex Mediation, perhaps, is the one that has presented us with most of the challenges, like the ones uh, Sarah has been addressing, the problems of lack of communication from lawyers, lawyers who have been representing uh, a party in court. They have been advised or asked to go to mediation. But because this lawyer is not keen <laughs> on going to mediation, because they might lose uh, revenue in the form of fees, they are not keen in participating in the mediation process. There are those challenges. You write to them emails, they don't respond. You try to call, you know, they give you uh, different explanations as to why uh, they don't want to come to the, to the mediating table. Uh, or if they come to the mediating table, they ensure that the party who comes doesn't have authority to buy it. So there are those challenges that may arise when you are dealing with different types uh, of mediation. And therefore, uh, that means that uh, we have to come up with uh, unique uh, strategies and ways of trying to uh, you know, bring on board lawyers because they are critical stakeholders in the justice system in Kenya uh, because of the various roles they play in the dispensation of justice. Again, having said that, I must also add that lawyers, as Sarah has mentioned, can be and have been an impediment to the dispensation of you know, justice you know, in the courts, but most importantly, in the mediation, because mediation has been seen, you know, and this has been said many times, as contributing to a decline in the revenue that uh, lawyers are entitled to. So how do we uh, deal with these lawyers so that we bring them on board, we make them you know, critical stakeholders who can support the mediation process and see the bigger picture, that the bigger picture is to ensure that these parties you know, are able to find workable solutions to the problems that they have been facing. So in the second section here, I just highlight a few areas or a few uh, uh, things that lawyers may help in the mediation process to speak to my first uh, uh, argument that lawyers, they play a critical role. They may not be the dominant stakeholders in mediation, but they do play certain critical roles. And those critical roles that they play, you know, can help in the mediation process moving forward more constructively, more creatively, and result in workable solutions. But all that, again, is dependent on how the mediator, you know, uh, deals uh, with the advocates representing parties. So I will speak to the first uh, limb of the mediating council, the, the advocate representing uh, a party. The advocate representing a party, of course, we are aware that most of the lawyers are there to protect the legal rights of their clients, especially when you're dealing with, with quarter-next mediations. The lawyer was appointed by the client in the first place to protect them. And it's not to protect them by persuading you in a nice way as the mediator, they are trained in the adversarial process where they have to be combative, they have to fight to win you know, their client's case. So the lawyer, when they come to mediation, they might find themselves trying to you know, fit into those shoes of litigation. They might not be able to remove the litigator's cape. You know? So they may want to do that, protect their legal rights of their clients. However, it is important, and this is important also for the mediator, to caution the advocate who is representing a party that yours is not the adversarial posturing in court. Yours is to, yes, protect the legal rights of your clients, but, you know, ensure that you advance those interests. But you should not assume, you know, the litigator's posture where you have to come and fight, uh, disrupt the other side by raising objections after objections, 
No, as you said, the ground rules as the mediator, you will have to speak to that so that the mediator, you, 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 you bring this advocate on board who has, you know, these conflicting uh, obligation to protect legal rights of their client, but at the same time, advance the interests of the client in the mediation process. Number two, uh, it is also possible for this advocate who is trained in the adversarial processes of litigation and arbitration to assume the role of a negotiator in the mediation process. You know, and uh, perhaps, and in my own uh, personal view, this is what we as mediators should, you know, try to emphasize to uh, advocates who are coming to mediation, you know, that they can play a quintessential role in helping, in persuading the other side, you know, when given the opportunity, or if the mediator thinks it's possible for them to comment, you know, it is not just to come and be tough and fight and raise legal arguments because that might, you know, take the focus of the parties from the interests, you know, into legal issues. It's, you know, it's a more conciliatory. You know, even the tone, the manner in which the lawyer speaks during these negotiation processes in the caucuses is a conciliatory tone. It's a tone that seeks to look at the bigger picture, the interest of the client. He's a business client. You know, the advocate here is concerned about, you know, the solutions that are, for example, business oriented. You know, so the lawyer is not concerned about their fees, about winning the case, you know, and getting their fees. They should be problem solvers as they seek uh, uh, to help their clients in the negotiation processes. The lawyers also, as the process of mediation progresses and there is an agreement on a number of issues, the lawyer may be called upon by the mediator to review the settlement agreement. And this is a critical role or even draft the settlement agreement, you know? Um, and uh, when this is happening, this is an area where the mediator who is not trained in law can also benefit, you know, from the skills of the lawyer in terms of drafting of the uh, mediation uh, settlement agreement so that it can be enforceable. And this is important, uh, especially when we look at the mediation bill, because if your settlement agreement is not in consonance with the law, you know, it is uh, not enforceable, it can be set aside. And we'll discuss that when we look at the mediation bill. So for here, the lawyer can help in ensuring that the settlement agreement, you know, clarifies who is to do what, who is to pay the 100,000 shillings, you know, who is to put up that new plant, you know, as agreed by the parties. When is that activity to be done? Where, how, you know, and what are the consequences of not doing that? So if you have a mediator, they can, be helpful to you as a mediator in, in, in that uh, respect. But of course, again, when it comes to the recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements, the lawyers will play a critical role. They might be called upon, you know, by their parties to help them uh, have that settlement agreement enforced just like any other court judgment. But also behind the scenes and before the mediation uh, begins, we also see lawyers playing critical role. For example, in the Cotanex mediation, we have seen lawyers are the ones who prepare the case summaries, you know, and they send them to, they send them to the mediation uh, registrar and we get those summaries as mediators, you know. <clears throat> uh, uh, so that is another uh, useful role in terms of helping, you know, clarify uh, the facts, the issues in, in disputes. Again, if mediators have been, if advocates have been trained in mediation, they understand the workings of mediation, they can play a key role even before the mediation starts of educating clients, you know, on, you know, the importance of mediation in enhancing access to justice, you know, and bring about expedited justice and encouraging them to consider, you know, mediation, 
because it might bring about long-term solutions, it might reduce costs, etc., etc. So again, lawyer, uh, lawyers, advocates, if we bring them on board, you know, we train them adequately on mediation, they can help the mediator in terms of ensuring the process is constructive, it moves on um, in a better way. During the mediation process, again, you might find after a party has made their statement, their opening statement, they have stated the facts, you know, the lawyer may want to, you know, uh, supplement that statement by adding a few legal points uh, that, of course, as a mediator, you have, you may need, if necessary, to allow the advocate to make those uh, uh, comments in terms of supplementing uh, the statement of the party they are representing. And of course, I'm saying if necessary. Um, again, a person who is a lawyer who is representing a party in mediation, uh, especially private mediations, where there is a contract between the parties to the dispute, and that contract has a mediation clause it is important for you as an advocate, again, to check whether there was any condition precedent to the commencement of mediation. This is important because if private parties initiate the mediation process without exhausting any other you know, process before coming to mediation, for example, negotiations, direct negotiations, or amicable settlement before mediation, you know, that can raise issues of jurisdiction of the mediator. And if an issue of jurisdiction is raised, that could lead to the mediation settlement being set up. And if you look at the, the proposal, a mediation settlement, a settlement agreement may be set aside if, is if you know, there was no jurisdiction to proceed with the mediation process. And jurisdiction, of course, as you may be aware, uh, comes or is donated by the agreement, the, you know, the mediation, the mediation clause. So the lawyer can help check that mediation has not been commenced prematurely. They also may assist the mediator during, during uh, the mediation. If a party, for example, uh, is too emotional, is not able to communicate, you know, and the mediator is not able to, you know, uh, have this uh, person talk, you know, the mediator may get the assistance of the counsel to get the client to, for example, listen or talk, you know. It could even be that uh, the party is not conversant with the language being used in the mediation. So the counsel may help clarify what the dispute is about to the party they are representing, and also clarify legal issues where there is need for clarity uh, to the party. And of course, again, when you look at the mediation bill that we will mention briefly, you will see that the proposed bill also recognizes that the mediator may call in experts to speak on one or two uh, technical issues. And a technical issue mediation in mediation might touch on law meaning that in both private and the quarter next mediation, you might still find yourself as a mediator inviting an expert in law to come and talk on one or two legal issues in the mediation. And then of course I have addressed the issue of in-house legal counsel. In-house legal counsel, again, they are advocates, they are lawyers who are working with organizations, you know, uh, who are based in uh, organization, in corporations, in places of work. Uh, and those lawyers, as I've said, again, they have important roles, uh, you know, in mediation. They may not may help you as a mediator determining the dispute that, you know, is before you, but they play a role in promoting mediation. For example, they may introduce mediation clauses into commercial agreements, into employment agreements, you know, and that way, you know, uh, that might uh, popularize mediation in our context. Again, they can make their corporations, their employers aware of the benefits of mediation, you know, by 
you know, encouraging them to pursue mediation as opposed to going to court. If a party is represented by in-house legal counsel, it is advantageous, you know, uh, because the in-house legal counsel, of course, knows about the workings of the company and they know about the facts better than an advocate who is appointed to litigate in court. You know, and you will find that in-house legal counsel, they are more amenable to mediation as opposed to uh, uh, the litigators. I use that with a lot of uh, caution or qualifications. Again, uh, they may prepare, they prepare for the mediation session, they prepare the parties for the mediation sessions. And this is an important point, I think, that also Sarah raised. One of the things I have seen, one of the frustrations I have encountered, especially in the quarter next mediation, is a scenario whereby the advocates are not prepared for the mediation. They have not, for example, ascertained whether the party who is coming for mediation sessions has the authority to bind, has the authority to decide for the company. In one of the mediations, I handled a quarter next mediation. You know, the lawyer, of course, knew very well the, uh, the importance of sending a person with, you know, authority to bind, but uh, they send somebody who doesn't have the authority to bind, you know, and that uh, affected the commencement of the process because it will be an exercise in futility for you to proceed with the mediation. And then at some point, you know, you hear objections from counsel saying, you know, uh, my, my, the party who came for this process did not have authority to, to bind. But if you look at the med proposed bill now, it has tried to tame or to deal with this issue by uh, asking or requiring that, you know, uh, the mediator ascertains, you know, that the parties coming to the table have the authority to, to bind. The issue of authority to bind or to decide is not a big issue when you are dealing with natural persons, you and me. It's a big issue when you're dealing with uh, corporations. Now, point nine is a big issue, is a co co concern that uh, is there owing to the training that we have received as lawyers. At times, I have seen lawyers who are just coming, especially with the quarter next mediation, who are coming to the, to the mediation, not with the sole aim of seeking a solution, a workable solution to the problem, but for the purposes of just assessing, knowing, you know, about the strengths of the case of the other. And once you know about the strengths of the case of the other, you can know how to posture you know, in, in, in court, you know. So again, here as uh, mediators, that's a challenge that uh, we have to deal with, mostly with the quarter next uh, mediation processes. In the quarter next mediation process, again, you might find an advocate being important in bridging uh, the communication between the client and the mediator. And again, speaking to the concern raised by Sarah, because um, sometimes the media, as a mediator, we don't have direct contact with the parties. At times we don't have that direct contact. And we may try and reach the lawyer, you know, the advocate representing uh, a party, so as to, you know, um, uh, have them maybe attend a session or do one or two things. So they can act as a bridge uh, between you as a mediator and uh, a party. So in essence here, uh, you will note that the mediator, of course, sorry, the advocate has a number of roles, both before, you know, during, and also after the mediation process. And therefore, uh, we have, you know, to strategize, we have to think of different ways of engendering their constructive participation in the process so that you don't put them off, you don't keep them off. For example, you deny them an opportunity to, to comment. That could be the reason why an advocate will frustrate the mediation process. And we will be speaking to some of those uh, uh, strategies of you know, bringing them on board. I was dealing with the first limb of advocates 
representing parties and also those working in-house. But you'll also see that we, some of us are advocates and we are handling mediations. And there are also certain, you know, uh, teething issues that we encounter you know, when we are acting as mediators and one of the party who is appearing, you know, as counsel is an advocate. That also raises uh, some concerns. For example, there could be issues of uh, impartiality that might arise if I'm the mediator and one of the advocates representing a party is, you know, uh, a person that I'm familiar with, somebody that I schooled with, somebody that I work with, you know, we are directors in the same company, we are colleagues, you know, in the same firm or in the same institution, that might create perceptions of bias, you know, and those perceptions of bias might mean that you will not act impartially as a mediator, you know, uh, so it's always important to uh, pay attention to those uh, concerns. But again, when we are acting as advocates, you know, there is a tendency sometimes to think that we are legal advisors <laughs> to the parties that are appearing before us. I think as advocates, we need to dissuade ourselves of those temptations to prefer legal solutions, to prefer legal advice to parties, or even to counsel appearing before us, because ours is to facilitate discussions, communication. It is not to decide even. We don't have the mandate, the power to decide. You know? So we, we are not uh, legal advisors. And this is the case even in situations whereby parties are not represented. If they are not represented, you know, if they want, they can get an expert you know, to advise them on the legal issues. But it is not for us as advocates who are mediating to prefer to give legal advice. Uh, but again, and this is a thing that I have noted, number three, when we are advocates, we are mediators, come advocates, uh, there is a sense in which we might want to demonstrate to the lawyers appearing for parties that this is not court, this is not litigation. And we want to tell them, no, you have to sit at the back. You have to go to the extreme end. And, you know, depending on how you put it, that might create some kind of, you know, an enmity between you and the advocate. And the advocate may want to poison their clients so that they frustrate uh, the mediation process. So as advocates acting as mediators, we have a role here to ensure that we bring the council on board so that the council does not feel excluded from the process. Remember, the council representing a party in mediation has two hats, the litigator hat, you know, and the hat of, you know, negotiator in some sense, you know. So these uh, advocates may want to come with the adversarial posture and fight <laughs> for their clients legal rights, you know, so how do you tame, how do you work with these advocates? Maybe you can uh, politely ask them, you know, advise them, you know, as you set out the ground rules, what their role is, put it politely, clearly, so that they appreciate that this is mediation and they, they get to know what their role is, you know. And then of course, uh, you could also clarify to the council uh, as a mediator, stroke advocate, you know, about the commitment that you have, that your commitment is not to that parties to the mediation process, that your commitment is to the parties because, you know, uh, the mediation process, you know, as well to the self-determination principle, party autonomy is a party process. You know, and uh, your commitment as a mediator is to the parties, you know, to help them uh, speak and find a workable solution to the issues that they are uh, facing. However, even as we try to demonstrate that the commitment is to parties, we must ensure that we appreciate the role of counsel. Remember, your relationship as a mediator in the parties <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a new 
relationship. There has been a pre-existing relationship between counsel and you know, their client. So again, how do you uh, demonstrate that to uh, uh, the advocate? And of course, again, uh, it's also important here is advocate who is acting as a mediator to check on the extent of authority of party reps. You will know the importance of this uh, environment when we look at the mediation bill, the proposed bill, you know, uh, uh, regarding the role that has been given to the mediator to conduct an assessment of the parties and the disputes. You know, even before uh, the mediator commences the mediation process. So as a mediator, you have an obligation here to ascertain do the parties who are coming to the process have the authority to bind. So that again, you don't engage or participate in a mediation process whose outcome will be challenged later on in the High Court or the court that referred the matter to mediation. I've spoken to the issue of conflict of interest with a party or party representatives, especially for us who are advocates. The legal fraternity is quite uh, small and there is a likelihood that some of the party representatives who are advocates are colleagues that we schooled with either at the university at the Kenya School of Law or they are people we, are, we have been working with, you know, or we have some kind of a relationship. So that might present, uh, uh, you know, issues of uh, partiality, favorism, if we are to assume and to participate in mediation processes. Again, we have to be cautious in that respect. And if those, you know, issues of conflict of interest arise, what do you do? You know, there is the importance of disclosing to the parties so that the parties can say, yes, we are comfortable, you know, with you, or you yourself, you could again, you know, verify uh, to yourself whether you are comfortable pro proceeding with that uh, uh, process. The issue of conflict of interest is a critical issue, both in mediation and in arbitration. It's a common phenomenon for us, uh, advocates who act as mediators, both in mediation and in arbitration. Because sometimes you'll find a party coming before you, you, you didn't know that they are representing um, a particular person, and you have to make that disclosure about any relationship you have. Is it possible to meet the lawyers before the mediation commences as an advocate, um, mediator, and does that, or is that likely to create issues of conflict of interest? You know, we will uh, revisit that uh, shortly. So here again, I, I after looking at the advocate representing a party in the mediation and looking at the role of the mediator who is an advocate it is important to look at some of the strategies that you know i have encountered in my personal reflections and of course when i was discussing the mediator as an advocate i only focused on the legal nuances i didn't discuss uh, the basic uh, you know, uh, obligations that uh, mediators have, you know, both non-lawyers and uh, lawyers. So that's why I didn't discuss the basic skills, techniques, etc., etc., because we are familiar with, with all that. So I think one of the important things that I, I see uh, being very helpful in the mediation process, especially when we have advocates, is when it comes to the setting of the ground rules. And I think this is one of the places where as uh, mediators, we can be able to deal or to create a conducive environment for working with advocates. You know, uh, how, in terms of how do we make it, you know, known to the advocate, they are all in this private process. You know, how do we communicate that? You know, the kind of language we, we use to, you know, clarify the role of you know mediation the role of counsel you know so that we bring the counsel on board so that this counsel who is being paid by the client doesn't see the mediator as excluding them as you know removing them as taking away their client already there is a perception there is a perception outside there amongst most of us 
<laughs> that uh, you know ADR generally and mediation in, included is contributing to accelerated decline in our revenue as lawyers, you know, as legal advisors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you ha we have to be very strategic in terms of how we, you know, uh, uh, bring on board uh, council. So we clarify their role, you know, that their role in mediation is not the dominant role. You know, the party is the, is the center of the, of the process. The parties are the center of the process, you know, and the advocate is there only to supplement, you know, to play the behind the scenes uh, roles that we have highlighted up there. And of course, there are also times during uh, the process, especially uh, where you have made it clear in the rules that you can ask a party to leave if they are not complying. Again, if you have done that and you note, you realize that a lawyer is only keen in frustrating, in delaying this process, you know, you could politely ask counsel to leave maybe a private session, you know, or even the joint session, you know, if necessary, if necessary, you know. Again, uh, uh, as I have mentioned, the mediator, both the, the legal, the lawyer, who is a mediator, and also the non-lawyer, should also strive to give counsel an opportunity to comment in the joint sessions, especially in the first meeting. I have found this to be very, very helpful so that you bring on board these advocates who have a prior relationship with their client. For the, for the court and ex mediation, I find these uh, to be very, very uh, useful, giving them an opportunity uh, to comment uh, in the joint session. And again, even when you, for example, you are politely asking the advocates, you know, maybe to, to, you know, showing them their sitting position, you know, again, with the tremendous respect, uh, you have to guide them, uh, explain to them why, for example, you are asking them to sit at the extreme end, you know, and not next to you, you know, bring them on board by appreciating their role, uh, and also sticking to your mandate as the mediator. At times also, you may want to you know, rely on advocates to sell ideas to clients. You know, after the caucuses, the private sessions, you may, you know, you might realize that they are, the client maybe is not appreciating certain, you know, proposals, suggestions. You may want to confer with the advocate even ask the advocate to, you know, to sell the idea to their client, if that is possible, and if that idea can be easily bought if communicated by the advocate. Talking to advocates separately is also uh, useful, important, uh, where appropriate and where necessary, you know, so that again, you don't create a scenario whereby you are seen to be separating the advocate and the party they are uh, representing. Again, a, a mediator you can use a party to help in, you know, uh, keeping the lawyer in the background and so that the lawyer plays that, you know, behind the scene role. You know, if the party helps you in this respect, it can be even better because you won't be seen to be the person who is you know, not appreciating the role of counsel. Number six, I have not encountered number six where you have a lawyer or a team of lawyers from the same firm and the lawyer representing a party is, you know, uh, is not an ally, is not supportive of the mediation process. And, uh, you know, you want to get another lawyer from the same firm through the, the, the uh, as a party, you know. I've not encountered that, but it is a, a likely uh, avenue, you know, uh, that can be deployed. Again, uh, because we know the practice of uh, mediation, and mediation is a new phenomenon in our country, perhaps going forward, you know, as we develop the practice of mediation, we might get lawyers who have 
you know, experience, who have, you know, uh, a lot of experience in representing parties in mediation. And, you know, parties could be or should be encouraged maybe to consider those lawyers, lawyers who have expertise in mediation, but also in legal training, because those lawyers can be very much uh, helpful in uh, 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 supporting the process and ensuring that it proceeds constructively and more creatively. And of course, we have different uh, uh, points that we have uh, encountered in the plenaries. We will uh, hear from different uh, mediators uh, on how you have dealt with different advocates appearing before you. Now, before I close, I just want to mention a few things regarding uh, advocates and the mediation uh, bill. 2020. And one of the in sections I have flagged is clause 22, clause 22, which talks about the role of a mediator. I've just flagged the provisions that have a bearing on advocates and mediators, and where we need to be a bit uh, cautious as, uh, as uh, either party representatives or as mediators. If you look at clause 22, it enjoins a mediator to assess parties. <laughs> this is an interesting uh, provision, assess parties and the dispute to determine whether mediation is appropriate. This is an important provision because it seems to give us the mandate of screening <laughs> and uh, evaluating whether a particular dispute is worthy of determination through mediation or not. You know, and also, you know, looking upon assessing the parties, whether a party is one who can be able to, you know, maybe participate in the process, you know, is it a minor maybe, I don't know what the law is envisaging, is it a senior person, you know, uh, is it someone who doesn't understand the nature of the uh, process, you know, mentally insane, I don't know what the, what the law is envisaging here, uh, but assessing parties, can have uh, you know, a multiplicity of dimensions, assessing parties, you know, what are you assessing? You know? Assessing the dispute also has legal implications. Are you being assess asked to assess whether the dispute is one that is, can be determined through mediation? Are you being asked to determine whether you know, it is one that the law says cannot be resolved through mediation? You know, of course, the bill says that it, de it deals with simple disputes, but of course, there could be disputes that cannot be determined by a mediator. You know, so uh, what role or how can a lay person who is not trained in law determine that if they don't know what the legal position is? For example, you know, if it's a dispute touching on an illegality. How do you know that as a mediator who is not trained in the law? So that particular clause can have tremendous implications to our work as mediators. Again, mediators under clause 29 of the bill have been given the mandate to draw up, to draft and authenticate a settlement agreement. As I said earlier, for mediators who are not trained in the law, this is one of the areas where they can benefit from party representatives who are advocates. Why? Because if, for example, the way the settlement agreement is drafted is not in consonance with the law, or you enter into a settlement agreement that is against public policy in Kenya, under the proposed law, that settlement ag agreement might be refused or denied recognition and enforcement by the High Court or the court that referred the matter to uh, mediation. Or if the settlement agreement is pursuant to a private mediation process, again, you know, the, the, that settlement agreement may be denied recognition and enforcement by a court of law. Again, clause five makes it clear that lawyers, sorry, mediators are not legal advisors to a party as we have said earlier, and this now enjoins us who are trained in law to be cautious, to be careful when we are uh, 
uh, playing our role of educators in the mediation process. You know, so ours is to educate, you know, to help parties find workable solutions. It's not to give legal advice even to the underrepresented uh, party. And then, of course, there is the disclosure by the mediator, uh, which is captured in clause 19. If a mediator, for example, fails to disclose, you know, any relationship with a party or a party representative, that could be one of the basis for challenging, you know, the mediation process and the settlement agreement. So we as mediators not trained in the law, again, we must be alive to what the law is saying or the proposed law is saying, because it has a bearing on our work as mediators. It's also important to note, and this is important, both for lawyers and other mediators who come from professional bodies, that our appointments can be revoked. For example, if we have not been complying with the requirements of the professional bodies that we belong uh, to. For example, as an, as an advocate, car mediator, this provision requires me to be in good standing with the Law Society of Kenya you know, fully paid up, uh, you know, uh, have a practicing certificate. And of course, that also has a tremendous implication to advocates who uh, do not practice, you know, or who do not take out uh, practicing certificates. Again, the provision seems to be telling us that you need to have some professional background, some professional background for you to be a mediator under this proposed law, you know, which again is a bit, uh, you know, out of place with what we have, we were trained in mediation because we were told that, you know, you don't need to be a professional, for example, a lawyer, you know, you can't be a mediator. For example, where does this provision leave out those who conduct community mediations? And I know there are many, I have worked with communities and I've seen uh, community elders facilitating mediation sessions. I've seen church leaders, pastors, priests, you know, and other elders uh, facilitating mediation sessions, you know. So this is one of the provisions that in a way is uh, formalizing, legalizing mediation and it might in a very big way affect our practice of mediation. Their attendance and representation in mediation processes is addressed in clause 25. Uh, and of course, this provision in a way again recognizes that, you know, lawyers can and should participate as party representatives, but not only lawyers, even other uh, professionals, you know, can also participate in the mediation uh, 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 process. Uh, then there is the question of mediator, clause 31 deals with mediators who have handled a matter and then they want to act, they want to act as arbitrators between the same parties or represent a party in litigation that follows the mediation uh, process. You know? So the law seems to proscribe or prohibit mediators from assuming those other roles, either as arbitrators or advocates representing a party, unless the parties agree or the law allows uh, for that. And this now calls us as mediators, come advocates to be cautious. You know, because if I was representing a party in court, and then the court has ordered us to go to mediation. You know, does that mean then that after representing the party in the mediation, I should not represent the same party in litigation or judicial proceedings? So um, that has tremendous uh, implications, uh, but the implications seems to be touching on the mediator, not the party uh, 
the party representative. So it is the mediator who is uh, stopped from acting as an arbitrator or representing a party in any judicial process because of the likely uh, a conflict of interest that might arise. Uh, the other interesting uh, provision and uh, the bill is the duty of advocates to advise parties to consider mediation prior to litigation. Duty. Now here, advocates have been you know, fully uh, <laughs> integrated into the mediation arena. They have, you know, and this is all advocates you know, who are representing parties. So you must advise your client about you know, the possibilities of considering mediation before instituting litigation. And uh, I don't think many advocates will take this uh, positively. Of course, they will be up in arms because some will argue that you know, this is another factor <laughs> to the practice of law because in civil proceedings or in civil matters, what you are supposed to file in court as an advocate is the demand letter. You know, if you file a demand letter, that could or that suffices to show that we have tried to seek, you know, a resolution of this party. We wrote to the other party asking them to settle, they did not, and therefore that's why we are coming to court. So lawyers will not understand why again they are being asked <laughs> to encourage or to advise parties to go to mediation. But again, also lawyers will be saying, you know, why should I advise a party to go to mediation? I won't get enough fees in the, through the mediation process. It's a very short process. In three sessions, the matter might be resolved. But in litigation, I can be able to, you know, uh, get as much as possible in terms of fees, you know. But uh, it's something that I think needs to be looked into. There's obligation uh, to file mediation certificates before litigation, showing that as an advocate, I have advised a party to consider mediation. I have addressed the negative implications, but there is a positive side of these uh, uh, obligations. Because in a sense, it, it brings advocates on board, <laughs> you know, to consider mediation. And it is aimed perhaps to encourage mediation, both amongst the lawyers and amongst the citizens of this country. So I think that's a positive side uh, from where I stand, you know. But of course, we must be alive to the negative uh, sides of this particular obligation. And then, and of course, I know lawyers will uh, try to push for this particular clause to be removed. So how do we get a mid, a middle, a compromise? Then parties also have a duty to file a mediation certificate confirming that they have attempted, they have considered mediation before beginning uh, the litigation process. You know, again, it has a positive side of encouraging uh, mediation in the country as one of the processes that parties can use to enhance access to justice. Clause 39 is important to both mediators who are non-lawyers and mediators who are lawyers, but also to advocates representing parties in mediation. Why? Because Clause 39 outlines the grounds for refusing recognition or enforcement of a settlement agreement. Now, recognition here means you know, refusal to accept a document as legitimate, as valid, as lawful, you know. And of course, enforcement, you know, is that process towards ensuring that a party gets, you know, the proceeds, you know, the fruits or out of the settlement agreement. So if, for example, a party to the mediation was incapacitated, you remember there's a point where I said, the mediation bill has introduced a, an obligation on mediators to assess whether a party was, for example, insane. <laughs> Did a party come to mediation heavily intoxicated? <laughs> you as a mediator, you need to ascertain that because if you fail to, and then one of the advocates raises this issue that their client 
was heavily intoxicated. They didn't understand what they were saying. They didn't know what the process was all about. That could be the basis of refusing to recognize and enforce a settlement agreement. So all mediators, we have to be alive to this uh, aspect. What if you are dealing with a minor or a senile person, you know? So again, we have to be alive to these considerations. An advocate on the other side might tell you as a mediator, Madam arbitrator, Madam mediator, you know, this particular party, you know, is senile or doesn't understand the language we are using, you must be alive to that as a mediator because it could possibly affect the enforcement of the settlement agreement later on, later on, you know. Uh, again, uh, you know, if there is invalidity of the settlement agreement, now, this is the agreement, you know, that is the settlement agreement is invalid. Maybe it has dealt with a criminal matter. <laughs> and the law says that criminal matter should not be mediated. If that is the legal position, you know, your settlement agreement can be denied recognition and enforcement. If your appointment was unlawful, for example, you are appointed a mediator and you are not one of the listed accredited mediators by MAC. That could be the basis of, you know, your settlement agreement being denied recognition and enforcement. And the proposed law makes that an offense. So the mediators who are not lawyers, it is an offense under this proposed bill to participate in mediation if you are not one of the listed mediators or you're not in good standing, you know. Unlawful appointment could also mean that perhaps you are appointed prematurely, you know. There is, it is a private mediation and the mediation clause required, had a condition precedent before mediation starts. And you have been appointed before that condition precedent, you know maybe before negotiation has been attempted. So that could be an, an unlawful appointment. It could be that the mediation agreement, the mediation clause says that, you know, you appoint one mediator and then you appoint two. Or the law says you appoint two mediators to work jointly, you appoint three or one. That could be, uh, could amount to an unlawful appointment. Or you are appointed mediator in a matter but you are not competent in, that could be the basis. So here, lawyers representing parties, mediators who are advocates have a critical role to play here. Again, the settlement agreement, if it's not binding on the parties, <laughs> again, maybe a party did not sign, <laughs> you know, it is not binding on me, so it cannot be enforced in court. Again, if the making, the making of the settlement agreement was induced or affected by fraud, bribery, corruption, or undue influence, you know, maybe the mediator was bribed. The mediator was bought tea by one of the advocates or by one of the parties, you know, which affected their impartiality, you know, or you know, the manner in which the appointment was made, the arbitrator, you know, <laughs> was appointed through corruption. Or there was undue influence. One of the parties or the mediator, you know, uh, exercised, you know, undue influence on a party so that the party considered or agreed to a certain outcome, you know. So undue influence, and this could be a common phenomenon when you are dealing with big corporations and employees, employers, employees, you know, uh, doctors, uh, patients, those relationships are some of the relationships that may create, you know, uh, situations of undue influence. So we have to be alive there as advocates, as mediators. And then recourse to judicial proceedings. Again, this is important in the proposed law because it shows the intersection, the interlinkages between mediation and, you know, the court process, you know. So under 36, the law seems to be saying that, you know, 
are party may seek interim measures of protection. For example, the subject matter in dispute is a building and the building maybe is threatened by demolition or some goods which are likely to be destroyed, they are perishable, you know, a party may want to seek, you know, interim measures of protection, an injunction, for example, from court, you know, so a party may go to the court that referred them to mediation, you know, or uh, the high court. Again, there can be challenge to jurisdiction of the mediation process. This is an important consideration, especially when dealing with private mediations where parties have entered into, you know, mediation, have put mediation clauses in their commercial agreements or, you know, employment agreements or other transactional uh, contracts. You know, uh, it could be that the mediation was initiated without following the process envisaged in the clause. That could raise issues of ju jurisdiction. Again, the appointment, if it was not, uh, uh, as per procedures or the contract, that can be the basis for challenging, uh, you know, the arbitral process. And then there are criminal penalties uh, <laughs> under the proposed law. And again, as lawyers, as uh, non-lawyers acting as mediators, we need to be alert, alert and alive to these provisions because they have tremendous implications. For example, if you are facilitating mediations without being accredited, this has you know, positive and negative sides. You know, because my first reaction after looking at this provision is that it is in a way actually criminalizes, you know, out of court mediations, which I think it's not a, a positive thing if we are to embrace ADR in our country. Does it mean that if you are an elder who has not been accredited by Mark, or you are a pastor who has not been accredited by Mark, or a priest, you know, or a traditional elder who can facilitate <laughs> discussions between parties, does it mean if you help parties to resolve an issue that that's a criminal offense? I think that particular provision may need reconsideration, you know, but the positive side seems to be, you know, the regulation dimension to streamline, you know, the accreditation processes so that those who conduct mediations are those who are trained and the government is sure that they will be able to do their work well. But uh, I believe that there is a sense in which we need a middle ground in that because we are criminalizing, you know, the good work of many community elders, many private individuals, you know, even chiefs, you know, even community elders, they do a lot of work in uh, mediation. It may not be mediation, but they do a lot of work in that respect. Breach of the code of conduct, again, for example, the code of conduct under the, the court annex mediation breach could be uh, could occasion a, a criminal penalty. Failure to make disclosures as a mediator. This is important to us lawyers. We must disclose any relationship we have with a party. You know, if we are director in that company, if we have worked with that uh, party before or a party representative we scrolled together, disclose. Failure to, to dis disclose is a criminal offense under this proposed law. Again, disclosure of information to third parties who are not party to the mediation process, again, it's a, a criminal offense. The criminal offense, the offenses under the act is a fine not exceeding two million Kenya shillings or a sentence not exceeding two years imprisonment or both. So as mediators, you know, again, the law is on our head, you know, we are under siege, you know, and I don't know whether this is a good thing. Uh, as I conclude, I beg to just uh, to comment that, you know, advocates role in, in mediation may not be as dominant as it is in litigation, however, they and our different experiences and reflections demonstrate that they can play 
a critical role in making the process move smoothly, more constructively, more creatively, and they have a role even, you know, in ensuring that the outcome of the negation processes is legitimate, is legal, and it works for all the parties uh, to uh, uh, the mediation process. I think it is important also to, uh, for us advocates who appear as parties in mediations and as mediators to know that, you know, our litigator's heart may work to our detriment in mediation. And so we have to temper it by assuming a more conciliatory uh, posture a more, you know, uh, uh, amenable uh, posture that facilitates the resolution of disputes as opposed to creating rules. I think it's also important as the mediation practice is growing in the country, some of us, you know, perhaps we could consider specializing in representing clients in mediation. This is an issue that we can create. And I think for young mediators who are advocates, I think we could consider this, you know, create, you know, uh, a niche in representing clients in mediation as opposed to court. But of course, this will require us to bring young advocates on board and convince them that, of course, there is also money, there are benefits in representing clients in mediation processes, not only as mediators, but as party representatives and so that also they can refer parties to mediation as opposed to pushing or referring parties to court. I have done that many times. Parties have come to me and I've encouraged them to come to SDRC, you know, and have their disputes resolved here because I'm not interested in, in the fees. Only. I also want to help the parties find amicable solutions to the problems they are encountering. But of course, I am flagging the fact that it's difficult to take off the litigator cap for us who are advocates and uh, replacing it with the negotiator cap. I beg to stop at this point and uh, uh, we could have now the conversation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much to the organizers of this uh, forum for giving me the time to just share those very brief uh, uh, reflections and experiences uh, this far. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari, for being able to take us through uh, the, the different areas. And uh, uh, clearly, it is uh, we can see that it is important to have uh, the, the council in the process. And uh, you have been able to share with us how we can be able to incorporate them uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, within the process. Uh, I'll just uh, open up uh, the space that is available now to be able to receive uh, questions and uh, comments. Uh, we did receive some questions in advance, uh, so I'll be sharing those in a little bit. And I'll just uh, request uh, Wendot. Wendot was uh, uh, to give some comments and then we'll be, I'll be able to share some of the questions that have been shared in advance and some that have been shared in the chat. Uh, Wendot? Susan? Um, Susan, are you on? Okay, we'll, we'll get back to, to Susan in just a little while. Uh, but I'll just uh, put across uh, some of the questions that I have been able to pick uh, from, from the chat. Uh, let me start from uh, uh, one of the positive ones. I think we had uh, uh, Tabitha Rutere. And Tabitha mentioned that uh, there are two advocates, Irene and Kiboi, who are advocates in Eldoret, who uh, Tabitha says have been extremely supportive of the mediation process. Um, apart from that, uh, uh, some of the questions that uh, have, have, have been forwarded 
comment, uh, Edwin uh, commented, he said that uh, the relationship between mediators and advocates need not uh, be adversarial. Uh, questions that uh, have been put uh, forward, uh, one question. Uh, do, do lawyers get trained for the mediation chambers or do they get trained uh, for court uh, litigation uh, chambers? So Dr. Tari, probably you can put down some of the questions and then I'll, I'll probably read two or three at a go and then you can be able to respond to those oh, yeah. uh, together. So one is uh, do lawyers get trained for the mediation chambers or the court litigation chambers? Uh, another question uh, in line with that, uh, is the notion that uh, legal training is adversarial, is this uh, something that comes back to the client or is this notion something that is used as an excuse or a crutch uh, in, the, in the mediation uh, process? And then uh, another question was... Uh, you don't have a class. Question that you could take the tarry is uh, uh, can a mediator in a matter uh, serve as an arbitrator in a separate matter concerning the same uh, uh, parties? So, the tarry, you could take those three and then we will be able to come back to you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and the participants for those uh, questions. Uh, Yes, I, yeah, there is a comment uh, you mentioned about, I think it's by Tabitha, where she says they are advocates who keep defending clients. And I think I can tie that to the two questions, the first two questions on uh, whether law lawyers are trained for court chambers or court litigation or mediation chambers. And the second one, which deals with the legal training, whether the adversarial argument about legal training is an excuse in mediation. I think the question about uh, the adversarial nature of uh, legal training is a real thing. It's not a myth. The way we were trained from uh, first year of law school we were trained in what is called the common law tradition. And under common law tradition, where we borrowed, you know, these Western, the Eurocentric uh, tradition and uh, positioning of the place of a lawyer in society, that the place of a lawyer in society is to fight for their client, is to defend their client, is the mouthpiece of their client. Now, when you bring that uh, posturing to mediation, of course, even conceptually and in practice, there is a, there is a conflict because you have an, a party uh, who is representing a client who actually has to fit into this new posture where they have to be more you know, amicable, they have to be more conciliatory in their approach to the issues that are facing their clients. Yet, the way we were trained and the way we are still being trained to date, <laughs> we are trained in the manner of ensuring we fight for the rights, for the rights of our clients. So that when I'm dealing with an employment dispute or a succession dispute, and you have appointed me as a, an advocate, I will be looking at the rights of my client. What is the contract saying? So the nature of legal training and dispute resolution in court is about allocation of rights and obligations. Uh, there, there is no concern about bring about reconciliation. And this is the problem even in criminal matters. That's why we have jails, uh, you know, and uh, prisons all over because 
even the criminal justice lawyer, you know, and except in the recent days, that's when we have been trying to encourage restorative justice. The focus of a common law trained lawyer, like in Kenya, is to fight for the rights of their clients. And then the state, which is a critical player in the justice system, and here the state, I mean the, ju the judiciary, the executive, I mean even the office of the director of public prosecutions, they as is concerned with you know, the protection of those rights. So that if you have committed an offense, you have to be jailed. You have to be put in prison. You have to pay some fines. You know? So we are penalizing. We are not concerned with some of the good things that mediation, for example, does. Restoring relationships, helping parties find workable solutions if we are in business. How can we find solutions that work for all of us? So I would say this is largely a problem. It's a colonial uh, relic. It's a colonial legacy that has continued up to today. If you look at the books we are using in universities to train, <laughs> we are still using these colonial textbooks that uh, are written by foreigners, where they are focusing on these individual you know, notions of justice, on punishment, on retribution, you know, they are not concerned about the communality, which is there in Africa. They are not concerned about Ubuntu, about Utu, about these principles of sharing, the principles of living together. Uh, that can only be, is only emphasized when we take this 40 hour course <laughs> in mediation, uh, or we, you know, we take uh, ADR courses generally. So it is not a myth. It is not uh, a creation. It's not an excuse when lawyers assume that posture in mediation. And that's why in my view, and I've said this before in other forums, that we have a lot of work to do uh, in, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, looking at our curriculums in law schools so that we decolonize those curriculums, you know, both in law and in other spheres, so that we help our students see that justice cannot be seen from the lenses of these Eurocentric uh, notions of justice, that justice can also be seen from Afrocentric lenses, where we see the community, where we see the value of working together, where we, you know, we are concerned about restoration as opposed to you know, uh, fighting each other, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then can a mediator serve as an arbitrator between the same parties? I would say conceptually, this is possible because even in the general practice and in the general training of, uh, of uh, ADR, we normally tell uh, our participants, for example, the charter administrative so arbitrators, that we have an, a mediation, a dispute resolution process called MEDAB. Med up, where you start with the mediation and then you go to arbitration. So it is possible. However, <laughs> there are certain practical uh, challenges or teething issues that will arise if the mediator who was sitting in the same dispute between the same parties is to assume the role of an arbitrator. And I will just point one thing. You see in mediation, we have the liberty to hold caucuses, private sessions. And in those caucuses, you know, there is disclosure. We hold those caucuses without the other party you know, being there. Now, that can be raised by one of the parties, you know, after the arbitral process. And it could be used to challenge the arbitral process, the arbitral award, you know, because a party could be saying, this party has given a favorable arbitral award to the other side because they were having a certain relationship. And of course, you know, even in mediations, there is that uh, uh, notion, there is that perception that if I'm meeting a party separately from the other, that I might be influenced, you know? So there, is, there are those uh, uh, challenges, there are those potential uh, challenges that can arise. You know, again, you might be seen not to be impartial as an arbitrator. And the notion of impartiality in arbitrator is more, you know, uh, profound, more pronounced than even in mediation, because it's about the perception. It's about the perception. It's not even the actual 
uh, uh, the fact of being biased. So I think it's a possibility, it's a possibility, but there are practical challenges that might arise. But if you look at the bill that we have just uh, looked at, it seems to, you know, to proscribe against those uh, that made up, you know, possibility, which would be a good thing if it is adopted. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Terry, for that. Uh, I'll, I'll give an opportunity to uh, Wendot uh, to be able to uh, comment, uh, and then we'll come back to you with uh, uh, some more questions. Um, so, uh, Wendot, and then after Wendot, we'll also have um, a comment from uh, um, just a minute. Okay, Wendot, you can go kindly. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Sorry, I didn't get everything because my network was a bit unstable, but I'll just mention on a few things that I had. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we are. We are. Please oh, proceed. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kariuki, for that enlightening um, uh, discussion. I think from the other time, the bill is coming out very clearly now. The, 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 the section is coming out clearly. But my observation from your discussion is um, if mediation can be made a body, so that when there is representation from lawyers, it will just be coming to represent and uh, the, the, the mediation should be made in a very simple way that anybody can be able to follow the proceedings. I think if that one is done, uh, then there will be separation of um, the bodies. What is mediation doing and what is the litigation part of it is doing? So that a lawyer coming for a mediation will not come to the mediation with the mind of litigation. They should come with the mind of mediating so that they, so they help the, cut their um, grievances and restore their relationship. Then come, because at times they can be tempted to bring the issue of litigation. So um, thank you for that uh, clarification. And maybe there is need to encourage, maybe when lawyers are being trained as mediators to separate the two, litigation and mediation, or the ADR in general, so that when they are handling an issue, they have a different mindset. Uh, not the way you've mentioned, their mindset comes from their training, their training of uh, legal, um, matters. So maybe th those are the observations that I made. And then there's something, I think I'll ask a question because I didn't ask on the chat that you, the, the um, act is talking of you, you cannot write a settlement if you are not registered with the with code annex mediation. So what happens because there are many mediators who are not registered with the uh, they come. So it, it will be a bit uh, tricky for those of us who are not registered at the moment. So maybe that clause needs to be um, adjusted or amended so that every mediator can be able to, to, to sign or come up with a settlement with a client. So I think those are the things I, uh, some of the few things that I picked. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kariuki, Sarah, back to you. Um, uh, thank you, Wendot. Uh, Dr. Chari, would you like to comment about some of those issues like, uh, you know, the issue of registration and uh, whether, yes, please go on, Dr. Chari. Okay, thank you so much, uh, 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 Sarah and uh, Susan for those uh, comments. I think you, you raise uh, legitimate uh, issues and concerns in uh, 
the practice of mediation and uh, even in the regulation of mediation. Because if you look at your last comment, when the law, for example, is saying that you can't uh, be a mediator unless you are accredited by Mark, as I said earlier, that in essence seems to, you know, uh, prohibit or, you know, criminalize the work that has been done, you know, by informal uh, mediators, community elders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even if family members, they help parties come together and mediate. And some of those agreements, settlements, are recorded in court. You know, so uh, uh, this uh, I, I ought to be revisited so as to recognize the fact that there are multiple doors to enhancing access to justice. We cannot uh, uh, say that you can only access justice through mediation, through the quarter next mediation, you know, and there are even statistics uh, that have demonstrated that in rural areas, actually people don't even know about uh, courts. I have worked in places like Turukana, you know, and I have seen, for example, the workings of traditional justice mechanisms, you know, and for many years we know there are places in this court that do not have courts, do not even have a high court. And in those places, disputes have been settled through mediation, informal mediation, through traditional justice systems, so when we make a law like this, I think this is one of the problems of law reforms in Africa, in Kenya in particular, where we, we just make laws to impress donors. We, we don't make laws by looking at the reality of our society. My belief, even as I teach our students, is that law must speak to the social realities. Our laws should be to reflect our society. We shouldn't make laws that are, you know, are disconnected from the reality. How can you make a law that is regulating, you know, only commercial mediation and you leave out, you know, the work of informal mediators? I have worked in, uh, in Kilifi uh, because I, my, my work, uh, I, I did some projects there and I could see the work, for example, done by the rabbi elders. They are working with, the, with the, the chiefs. They are working with the courts there, you know, informally. They are not uh, recognized or recognized by Mark or by the court annex mediation. So we have a problem when we have our law makers, our law reformers who are actually, you know, still, you know, feeding us with these Eurocentric conceptions of law, of justice, you know, and what that is doing is that it is affecting development because we are pursuing development that helps the middle class and we leave out uh, other members of the society. But having said that, let me say that if you look at the Civil Procedure Act, the Civil Procedure Act, there's a sense in which it recognizes the place of private mediation agreements, you know, in the sense that yes, parties can have someone who is a mediator and that person can help them you know come up with a settlement and the settlement can be recognized in a court of law the only problem is that this law this proposed law seems to say that it will be the overriding law it will take precedent over any other law dealing with mediation and of course from a legal perspective that might pose a number of challenges and the last one which Susan you raised uh, and I agree with you is that you know having these laws it's good in terms of legalization accrediting mediators for the commercial for the commercial disputes but the law must be alive to the fact that you know mediation is an informal process and the more we continue legalizing it it is the more we are going to make it more or akin to litigation. We are going to make it more like arbitration, you know, because there's no difference now between arbitration and litigation. It is more like the same process. It has, and the processes have been taken up by lawyers. So my, my worry is that with this legalization, you know, we might find ourselves, you know, making the process more legal, putting off non-lawyers from the process, you know, 
which is not a good uh, thing. We need to embed, we need to, in, to be inclusive, even in terms of our legislative processes. And what uh, you will be, uh, I am seeing even in this law, it even has certain wars between the executive and the judicial. For example, when you look at the constitution and who is to constitute the mediation accreditation committee, that mandate seems now to be taken away from the judiciary and taken to the executive, the office of the attorney general. So as we are having those <laughs> governmental wars, it is us mediators, it is you mediators and the party representatives who want to bring about justice who will, who will suffer. So I think also the government and the legislature, they also need to uh, be alive to some of the difficulties that will be posed by such kind of uh, a law. Yes, uh, Sarah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari. Uh, I'll just invite uh, uh, William again to be able to make some comments before we move on to uh, Mohammed Said. Um, uh, William, um, please proceed. You can be able to unmute yourself. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to just make a brief comment. Uh, yes, I I agree and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari, for a very well uh, elaborated uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much, uh, members. Mine is to actually respond and maybe also comment on a question that uh, came from one of the participants about our system. And uh, as an advocate and also a teacher, uh, I just want to say that uh, and agree with Dr. Tari that uh, our system is an Anglo-American uh, system and as such very adversarial. However, when it comes to matters ADR, and just like Dr. Ari has mentioned, we as lecturers now uh, at the various faculties of law uh, are encouraged, especially where we have such curricula. Uh, at Catholic University of Eastern Africa, for example, we have ADR and arbitration as a unit. And uh, that said, we have lecturers that are also mediators, meaning that students who elect uh, such units, because at the moment it is an elective, uh, then get the opportunity to not only be taught the substantive uh, law touching on ADR and arbitration, but also get the opportunity to be trained at that level. And that is something which even we, I, I teach civil procedure, for example, but at the same time, under order 46, there is arbitration and alternative dispute resolution uh, by reference uh, of court. But in addition to that, we, I also make sure that I encourage my students, though lawyers, though in the system, in the Anglo-American adversarial system, to be able to change gear such that if they find themselves in such a role of a mediator, then it is important for them if they are, if they are advocates to change gear and think as those assisting in the mediation process. So in as much as we are an adversarial system, in as much as we train our lawyers in adversarial system, 
we actually have no choice because even the constitution, I believe, and Article 159, uh, also emphasizes that uh, we, the courts should also take, uh, take into consideration uh, ADR and traditional systems. The only challenge, and as Dr. has mentioned, and I agree, that yes, there are, you know, uh, custom, uh, there are traditional systems of, 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 of settling disputes. The only challenge, however, that, that some, not all, some traditional mechanisms face is the subject matter. Because it is very clear, for example, that criminal matters, or what are perceived to be criminal matters in the English common law system may not be considered as such uh, when there are traditional elders trying to solve such disputes. They don't consider those as criminal. And yet uh, that kind of mediation would be very, very illegal and can be challenged anywhere. Uh, that said, it does not mean that we as Africans uh, should always agree to taking up laws from the English or from the Western lens. And in that case, I fully and I totally agree with, uh, with Dr. Karioki that it's important that our laws are informed by the social, because we also have political system, traditional political system, our social, political, and cultural, uh, and even economic systems that, that we have. So that, so that at the end of the day, our laws reflect who we are, and we take on sovereignty of our nations. So that at the end of the day, our parliament then should be a reflection of who we are. Th thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for that contribution. Um, I I'll give an opportunity to uh, young mediator Mohammed to be able to give a commentary before we come back to Daktari as we will be closing. Uh, Mohammed? Mohammed, you may proceed. Okay. I think we might have uh, lost Mohammed just in uh, a little while ago. Uh, so I I'll just want to remind us that uh, we'll be having another session uh, just uh, moving on from this in, in the month of, of, of August. Uh, so we'll be able to address, you know, some of the other issues that have come up. But uh, as I give uh, Daktari an opportunity to make his uh, final comments, uh, there's just uh, one question that has uh, caught my attention from uh, Florence. And uh, uh, Florence asks about how, how will we maintain professionalism given that uh, it seems that uh, mediation has been opened up for all. So, uh, Dr. Tari, you can take that as uh, uh, you also give your final comments and then we'll be able to proceed from there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you also to Molly William for those uh, comments and contribution, uh, which are very, very good. Uh, uh, on the comment raised by question raised by Florence regarding where is the professionalism if uh, we fail to regulate and let uh, every elder you know deal with a dispute when they have not been trained in mediation I think this is why I was saying as lawmakers as a judiciary as the executive as a citizenly we, we ought to recognize that it is not only through commercial mediation that we can have access to justice. There are many other disputes 
that are being resolved you know, informally through uh, using the formal processes. For example, I have worked with, in Turukana with Talo Oil on a, a project uh, reviewing the uh, community grievance mechanism. And I can tell you that having looked at their policies, those policies also recognize the place of traditional elders in resolving disputes. And I have uh, evidence of disputes that they didn't go to commercial mediators, they relied on elders because the elders can use traditional concepts. For example, the principle of like for like, that if the company has injured your camel, as a community member, you don't have to ask for 100,000 for a camel which has been injured or whose leg has been broken. The traditional elders will say, traditionally, we compensate uh, your camel with another camel. You know, so uh, we ought to recognize that, you know, uh, we can be able to have what is in formal mediation, have its place, have the commercial mediation and its place and regulate those professional mediators if there is need to regulate. But again, ensuring, uh, you know, for example, that we don't have those cases of for example, rogue mediators or rogue arbitrators conducting mediations and arbitration. So there is a place for regulation. There is a place for professionalizing mediation. But we shouldn't now criminalize or proscribe the work of, you know, elders, the work of community leaders who have been helping us. Actually, they say, uh, they give, uh, estimates that is over 80% of the disputes, you know, are resolved outside courts in this country. You know, we do not have the exact disputes because they say what comes to court is just a fraction, a very small fraction. And again, what we get as Cotanex mediators, it's a very, very small fraction again from the courts. So we will be regulating <laughs> a, very, a, a very small portion while leaving out, you know, uh, 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 a very huge constituency outside there and regulated. So I agree with you, Florence. Of course, for the professional ones, they need to be regulated, but don't criminalize, you know, because that's the same way when the colonialists came, they criminalized the, they criminalized the work of traditional elders, uh, you know, for example, through the Witchcraft Act, you know, the traditional dispute resolvers were regarded as witch doctors. You know, they were regarded as mystical workers, you know. So we shouldn't be going to where we were a hundred years ago with the colonialists. We need a change of mindset. We need to have a society which is more inclusive, not only in, you know, in governance, in the executive, but also in the justice sector. Let us bring all these actors in on, on, on board because there are many, many people who will access justice if we recognize both the professional and the non-professional. And of course, for the traditional elders, there is work that is going on within the judiciary under the Judiciary Training Institute, where they are trying to come up with ways of trying to ensure that even those elders who work extra legally are also uh, recognized and their work is uh, given the, the, the force of law. So I stop at this point and uh, I wish to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Sarah, I wish to thank um, uh, Wangari and all the other people who are involved in setting up this. I appreciate the opportunity. It's a, it's a great uh, a privilege and honor. And I look forward to working uh, with you and attending uh, your future sessions. Let me also thank all the participants for their questions and also the comments that they have made uh, in this particular session. So thank you and have a good uh, evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Wangari. Ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, a joy to have been and to continue to be part of uh, this particular session. I wish to thank all the colleagues who have been able to join us and also uh, Dr. Francis Karioki. I am so delighted that we are not yet done with you because truly we are not yet done with you on this subject um, of mediating council and we are looking forward to the next session that we'll be having with you.
um, in August. And uh, for colleagues, the uh, announcement for it will be made uh, very soon in the WhatsApp group and also through the email listings. So if you're not in the, WhatsApp, in the Kenya Mediators WhatsApp group, or you're not receiving the uh, email communications from Wasiliana Hub, I encourage you to kindly uh, send an email to Wasiliana Hub and you will be able to be uh, very, very updated. Uh, Dr. Karioki, you were in the discussion on uh, the Kenya Mediation Bill. One of the things that really surprised me when uh, I received it, uh, when I saw it, and um, earlier on I had gone through some, a number of uh, mediation acts for uh, a number of the countries, uh, for instance, for Malaysia. It is a very, very simple, about 18-page uh, uh, document. And it's, I, I literally, it's one that you can say that anyone can understand. Uh, the, uh, for, it's, it's actually a 14-page document. And it seems to, uh, to have been designed so that it can be able to serve not only someone who is uh, uh, in what we are calling later like a, a mediation trend, but also even someone who will engage in a mediation, they can actually go through it and be able to understand what exactly a mediation is. I think that is one of the um, areas that we could uh, look into as a country and also be able to, to borrow. It could be a step in the right direction. However, the key concerns that we do have is that sometimes you put in a step which is not necessarily aimed at uh, promoting, but actually at stifling. Are we uh, actually causing mediation to be uh, uh, looked at from the lens of uh, what um, we, we, we say is um, litigation? And yet it is also not litigation that is, um, uh, if I'll call it, let's say Afrocentric, but it is what we have uh, borrowed over the years. So uh, not diluting uh, what uh, Dr. Francis Karioki has taken us through and also the remarks from uh, our uh, mediator, uh, Susan Wendot, and also the insights uh, from uh, Mwalimu William Bagan. And thank you uh, very much, Mwalimu, for uh, sharing those insights. Uh, I wish to highlight to colleagues that uh, we have the uh, Kenya National Mediation Week coming up in on the first week of December, that it will be on the first uh, week of December, Monday first uh, to, uh, sorry, Tuesday first, then it will run on until uh, Friday 4th. And uh, it is will run from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we will be able to have so, uh, virtual mocktails from uh, 7 p.m. We will in uh, the uh, National Mediation Week. We will be looking at intercepting the dispute economy in Africa. And the question that will be on the table is why the mediation profession is not flourishing in Africa, or is it? Really? And what we will be looking out for from our speakers uh, during those uh, the, the sessions in that um, uh, mediation week, and also the speakers that we are having pre the uh, conference week, and these are the speakers from June, July, all the way, uh, uh, August, September, October, and November, is that they are preparing us into the conversation, which will give us a revelation of everything that, we, that the mediation and dispute resolution professional in Africa needs to know, to excel in the international dispute resolution space in this occasion. So ladies and gentlemen, we encourage you, please book your diaries because uh, the Mediation Africa Forum, the National Mediation Week is here with us. And we are looking at how to create a lot of excitement because the work that you do makes a significant difference, not only into uh, the families that you get to touch or the businesses that you get to touch, but also into the Kenyan economy. And we really think you can make an um, absolute difference. So ladies and gentlemen, with those uh, remarks, I do hand over back to uh, mediator Sarah so that she can uh, take us to the closing um, of this uh, particular session. So mediator Sarah, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wangari. I appreciate uh, that uh, information that you have shared with us. And uh, to all the participants, we appreciate you taking your time to join us and engage with the questions and the comments. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari, for taking time to just uh, be able to give this insight to us. And we actually do look forward to the next uh, uh, session that will be in uh, August. Uh, we are just uh, uh, concluding now. And uh, uh, we will conclude as uh, we normally do uh, uh, with the words of the national anthem, we will recite uh, the anthem in uh, Kiswahili, and then we will be able to close. E mungu, nguvu yetu, 
ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi uh, thank you very much mediators i wish you all a good evening and see you soon <laughs>